my whole family is actually, even though we're from India, born and they were born and raised in Africa, in okay. Kenya, where the TB vaccine oh. is mandatory. Oh, like yeah. They all have oh, like yeah. Little yeah. Stars yeah. On their yeah. Arm and stuff. yeah. And so it's when I told them that this too. was the yeah. you know, methods that she's using to strain of it, um, he said, well, we all end up testing positive for TB every time we do something. Yeah. Is that something that, like. Well, it's better now because um, it used to be that, you know, you had to do the PPD. That's the public health thing. So, like, right. you know, when she got employed here, she had to go to public health service and they did the little PPD test. I think I've done that. Yeah, I'm sure you have. It's a little blab right here. Mm -hmm. And then if you've got tuberculosis, it gets huge. If you got the vaccine, sometimes it gets big. That's the cheap way to do it. We now do a blood test on everybody that tells you whether you have tuberculosis or not. Right. Not the vaccine, whether okay. you have tuberculosis. Some of the risks that come with the TB vaccine, like cytokine storm syndrome and stuff, are, yeah. are there things like that that um, I should be worried about? No. So um, you should know this from the World Health thing. So this vaccine was developed 100 years ago. Yeah. Three billion doses have been administered. And other than in North America and Western Europe, it's a mandatory vaccine in every newborn in the world. True. So over a hundred million doses are administered every single year around the world. How did it take so long to figure out this could do? You know why? You know why? Because we didn't go after the BCG vaccine. We went after a pathway and mapped, you know, by cells, a pathway that was disrupted. Okay? And then we realized, oh my God, that's a major defect in diabetes and multiple sclerosis and lupus and all these diseases. And we knew in those diseases you needed more TNF. So we went out to every drug company and said to them, uh, we want to manufacture TNF. Well, there was two pushbacks. One, we had a paper in science. Okay, that was good. Everybody was making the mice happy. Okay. So, you know, there was a lot of happy mice around the world, but then everybody said, you really want to use TNF? There's no good manufacturing of TNF around the world. It has a short half-life, and if you have to reestablish TNF manufacturing, you're talking millions, and then you have to go into primates, and now you're talking about a trial eight to nine years from now. And we started doing the math, and we said, wow, that's really expensive, and then, um, we decided to set up a generic drug screen program to try to see if there was an existing drug that induced TNF. Well, sure enough, it was known way before maybe I was even born, but that BCG induces TNF. It's your normal immune response to the okay. bug. That's how TNF by Genetech was originally cloned. It was called Cachexin. And they realized with BCG, there was this hormone released. And when they cloned it, they renamed it TNF. So we said, well, why don't we use the 100-year-old vaccine? Right. So that's been the development Something problem. Something tried through. Yeah, impeccable really safety record. So how, how long have you been working um, with the type 1 aspect of using this? Oh, all oh, long, all oh, long, 25 years. Good. Yeah, so it's not like one of these things where we, we mapped the pathway. We were all excited about the pathways about 15 years ago. We knew where the defects were. We knew TNF would be beneficial, and we knew the mice. Is it exciting for you when you're seeing what happened in phase one? You know what's exciting is it's such flack. There's been such flack of moving a cheap drug forward, right? Why, why do you think that is? Oh, because there's, like, how do we normally get rewarded in academia? We get rewarded, like if you're sitting here and you're the PI of this lab, you get rewarded when Pfizer comes in and goes, we love your work, your, your, your work on heart disease is fabulous, we're going to come in and sponsor your lab and what you create, we're going to turn into drugs, okay? So that's a win-win for you, it's a win-win for the university, it's a win-win for Pfizer, Obviously. okay? Then Pfizer develops it, they're happy with it, and they come back and they see Sarah and they go, Sarah, you're the MD in the clinic, how many patients do you have with heart disease? And Sarah goes through records, oh, I got about 300. You know what? We'd love to have you be a clinical trial center. And Sarah's really happy. The university is really happy. So the problem is, if you come up with something that takes the disease away, right. and it's cheap. And it's easy. And it's easy. And there's not that many all around winners, basically. Yeah, the, the patients are the winners, and you know the healthcare system's the winner. Um, there's and not too many friends around. around. There's not too many friends around, okay? That's great. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Oh, yeah. Everything it's that's going on. We can't believe like we're in phase two. You know, it's like, it's a dream. Right? Has the response just been overwhelming 
Oh, for the patient side? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Ask them. <laughs> That's what I was 2,000 emails a week. Yeah, yeah. Really? Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you narrowing down who gets to come? Well, yeah, so that's not too hard. So what we're trying to do, we're trying, unlike most academic groups, just instead of playing around saying, well, it works, and um, then it's somebody else's problem to hope the healthcare system picks it up and gets it to market, because this one won't get picked up and get to market. We're actually trying to get the drug licensed. Okay. Okay. So these are very serious phase two trials that went all the way through the FDA and every, you know, little sheet of paper, hundreds of sheets of paper submitted. So we have to match the patients in order to use the phase one data. We have to match the patients used in phase one to the patients in phase two. How many patients did you use in phase one? Um, it was diabetics were six. Reference population was ninety seven. Okay, this is a much bigger trial. It's now 150. You're, doing, you're planning on doing five years of phase yeah, two. Yeah. How long did you do phase one? Uh, we um, have now followed them out eight years. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and they've all participated. <laughs> yeah, nobody misses the visit, right? How, um, when do you think, how long will it be before you have the 150 that? Um, well, we're working on it every day of the week. So you came in, other people came in. So it's not that we don't think it will work in. Uh, broader populations but so we don't we're one of the groups that discovered not all type 1 diabetics are the same okay with respect to how the pancreas gets uh, decayed mm -hmm. um, how um, uh, the etiology of the disease is different so we and you probably saw this data but uh, from our lab but anyways it's you know everybody said as endocrinologists your pancreas dies in the first year two years but making these great biomarkers, we now know there's a, a long gradual decay. And different people are in different stages of that decay. So for this phase two, we have to match the stage of decay with the people who were in phase one. Because then we can use the phase one data with the phase two data to try for licensure. And you're measuring that using people's CPEP? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So somebody may have a lot of CPEP and they go, well, how come I can't get in the trial? You've got too much. Okay. And somebody may be at undetectable levels and they go, oh, does it mean it doesn't really work? No. We just can't. We don't have the money. You want to help us raise money? Yeah. <laughs> I am. Yeah. 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 I know. Yeah. So, you know, we. Can, we want to make the resources we have go the farthest to get the drug to the public if it's showing efficacy. Now say I make it into the trial, my CPEP yeah, yeah, range, yeah. I'm going to get the PECG. How soon, and this is just in layman's yeah. T1 terms, yeah. can I expect to eat a burger and fries and maybe look at my CG and see it? Yeah, come? yeah. I mean, it takes, why did we follow people five years? This is not like you take uh, aspirin and three hours later your headache's gone. This is a, it's a trial, so it's, it's a trial. what we yeah. learn, you learn. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we're trying to give more doses this time to make it work faster, but we'll see. What's Maybe. your overall goals? Our goal is the trial. toughest goal probably ever proposed for a type 1 diabetic trial. And Change in hemoglobin and let's see. And then ultimately a cure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'll see where we are in this thing. If if, if I told everybody that uh, we, we unblinded the trial five years from now, and everybody's hemoglobin A1C is in the normal range now without any pumps, bells, and whistles. And uh, some people still have to take a little insulin in the morning, and they're never going to get a complication because, you know, I think people would be pretty happy. No, I think yeah. Not. yeah. Pumps, bells, and whistles. And yeah. Out. Yeah. What can you tell me from all the work that's being out there, that's being done out there, what's different about? what you're doing here in mm -hmm. the Fausman lab as yeah. opposed to what everyone else is yeah. doing. Yeah, so let's talk about diabetes trials and then we'll talk about autoimmune sure. trials. So for diabetes trials, these are really, um, we took a risk in phase one and we took a risk for two reasons. We decided to, to, to try to do trials in people who have the disease. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? right? I mean, everybody I should be doing, yeah. yeah. But every diabetic trial up until that point with respect to immune interventions were with kids that just got diabetes yesterday, a week ago, two weeks ago. If you had diabetes three months, no longer a candidate, let alone three years, five years, or ten years. So we decided that we should start doing trials in the people who were most needy for something dramatic. 
and not just try to limit it to kids who just got diabetes last So patients that have actually been diagnosed for multiple years yeah. are actually... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, 15 years out, 20 years out, gotcha. 10 years out. So that was unique. Um, um, the other thing that's unique is um, uh, this is a cheap drug. Really cheap. <laughs> so you like that. Um, and the other thing is that's unique that you referred to already is um, uh, we're going for hard outcome measures. Nothing like it's the third phase of a um, secretory response to glucagon and you have the same dose of insulin and who cares for six months whether your C peptide, your pancreas change. As a diabetic, you care what's my blood sugar control. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You want to know how is it going to be yeah. in the morning? How yeah. is the food going to affect you? How and everybody's argued with us, like, why pick that hard outcome? Nobody picks that outcome for type one yeah. in the in these kind of immune intervention trials. Um, but um, what are you predicting as far as success rate? Um, don't know yet. Don't know yet. Right. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't be doing this. It's it's a much easier life for me to do mice. The human trials. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the fundraising efforts. Oh yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's no, kind of important, okay? So this is. Uh, Give me a little bit of history of who's been supporting yeah, you, who yeah. is supporting you, yeah. and who else. Okay. Yeah, this is all uh, nonprofit uh, funded research, and for obvious reasons, um, if you're really um, aimed at taking a disease away, and you're really aimed at doing it with a cheap and affordable drug, um, there's not going to be a lot of interest in development of such a product in the commercial sectors. Right. So the entire support for the phase one um, was philanthropic and the entire support for phase two is philanthropic. So it ranges everything from little kids doing lemonade stands or schools getting together and uh, saying we want to give to the Mass General Hospital in this project to um, uh, people asking their neighbors to bike rides, to mountain climbing. We try to post these things on Facebook sure. because people are really creative. To you know, like our big supporters like the Iacocca Foundation. What have they done? Yeah, um, so they raised the original $11 million for phase one. And then for phase two, um, our goal is $25 million. We're about $19 million right now. So if you know anybody who, who loves these kind of novel projects, we, you, but somebody knows somebody, you know, it's amazing. I'll it's, find the next person that knows Donald Trump. Yeah, like yeah, that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a great story for healthcare reform.